In this video, we learn about timing code on your PIC32. And to do that, I'm going to be using the NU32 board, which you can see down here in this corner. And it's a little bit small, but maybe you can see the light flashing, LED1, telling me that it's in bootloader receive mode, ready to receive my new program. So the first way you can time code on your PIC32 is to use the core timer, which is associated with the CPU. Now this is a counter that counts one count every two CPU cycles. And since the CPU cycle is at, when it runs at 80 megahertz, the CPU cycle is 12.5 nanoseconds. That means every count of the core timer corresponds to 25 nanoseconds. And since there's 32 bits to the core timer, it can count up to 2 to the 32 counts, or about 107 seconds, before it rolls over and goes back to zero. So let's see some simple code that allows us to use the core timer. So we define two unsigned integers, elapsed ticks and elapsed nanoseconds. And the first thing we do is we use the peripheral library function write core timer zero. So that loads a zero into the core timer counter. And then you've got the code that you want to time next. And then after that, you read the core timer and put the result in elapsed ticks. And again, since each tick of the core counter corresponds to two CPU cycles, we take the elapsed ticks, multiply it by 25 nanoseconds, and that's the amount of time elapsed in nanoseconds. Now, since reading the core timer actually takes a few CPU cycles to execute, your result may only be accurate to within, say, 50 or 100 nanoseconds. And if the code you're timing takes milliseconds or maybe even microseconds, then that's no problem. But if the code you're timing takes nanoseconds and that resolution is not good enough for you, then you could just take that code and do it many, many times so that the error uh, is a smaller percentage of the total time. So in fact, we're going to do exactly that in our next example. We're going to look at an example where we execute a for loop 50 million times so it's slow enough that we can actually see the time with our own eyes. OK, so let's look at the program timing.c. OK, so timing.c is a very simple program. Uh, all it does is go into this infinite loop here where it just delays and then toggles the light. And inside of delay, uh, which just counts from zero up to the delay time, which in this case we set to be 50 million at the beginning of the program in a constant. So the delay just does this for loop 50 million times, exits, come back, comes back up to here, changes the light, and then does it again. So let's go ahead and uh, put that program onto our PIC32. We'll do that at the command line. So compiling uh, the NU32, compiling the timing.c file. Now we're going to write the hex file. And once we've finished writing the hex file, we've restarted the program. And here, again, it's hard to see because the light is small. But now the light stays on and then goes off. And after it's off for a while, after all the delay loops have finished, then it comes back on again. So we can time how long that takes. And I'll use a simple Unix trick to do that. So I, turn, I start timing when the light comes on. And then I'll stop it when the light goes off. OK. And so what this says is that the light has stayed on for about 6.25 seconds. And that's executing that. Um, that for loop, that delay for loop 50 million times. So if I take 6.25 seconds and I divide by 50 million, that means that each loop took 125 nanoseconds to execute. And 125 nanoseconds means that it took 10 CPU cycles because we know that each CPU cycle is 12.5 nanoseconds. Now, there's another way we could have seen that more directly. And let's see how to do that. First of all, let's take a look at uh, what files were created when we compiled. And we see here the ELF file and then the stripped down executable, the hex file. 
But we also created this map file, and this map file gives us information about where program was, or where uh, program code was installed in memory. But let's take a look at this ELF file first, and we're going to disassemble it so that we can see uh, the assembly code that was created. So I'm creating a file called out.disasm, oops. Oh, I'm sorry, Mis misspelled it, there we go. There we go. And now I can look at the file out.disasm, disassembly. And this is actual uh, assembly language code that was created when we compiled our program. So I'm gonna go look for the delay loop And here it is. And what you can see listed here is the code that, that this for loop has expanded to in assembly. And uh, these first couple of uh, operations up here are setting up the for loop. But then down here, we're going through the loop itself. And I won't go into the details of what each of these assembly commands is doing. But basically, the loop starts here at virtual memory address 90027D4. It goes down to here. And then at this, co this command here, BNEZ, it's checking to see if I is still less than the delay time. And if the answer is yes, then it's going to branch back up to 90027D4. So it's going to come back up to here, the starting of the loop again, and then go down again. So if I look at how many assembly commands are in this loop, I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And this no operation 9 is part of the loop 2. Basically, when you branch, you have to wait in a, a CPU cycle to let that finish. So what I see here is nine commands, nine CPU commands in this loop. And what we predicted over here was 10 CPU cycles. So what this shows us is that since we have the prefetched cache operating, the CPU is actually executing one assembly command every CPU cycle. Now, if we had gone back and changed our program to turn off the prefetch cache, and let's take a quick look at that. Down here, we see two commands that if I uncommented them, would turn off the prefetch cache. Now if I were to compile and run again, I would see that my light down here in the NU32, instead of coming on and off every 6.25 seconds, actually comes on and off at about 17 seconds, which corresponds to 27 CPU cycles, which means those nine assembly commands each took three CPU cycles to execute. So that's the difference between using the prefetch cache and not using the prefetch cache to speed up your code.